Hey world, this is your girl, Marky Lemons Ryle, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite, most underutilized subjects in the wonderful world of real estate. As you well know, I love nothing more than a referral check. And today I have Chad Durfee on who is like the king of all things referral and he is going to make me step up my referral game as well as you. What's going on today, Chad? How's it going? I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm elated that you're here today. I love referrals. I teach the referral and networking class for the Women's Council of Realtors. Uh, I do nothing but referral based real estate transactions because I'm always on the road. I actually have a couple of checks sitting in my office right now that are referral <laughs> that are referral nice. checks. And uh, it just well, it just baffles me. Why don't we do more? referrals. So I know that you specialize in referrals. What is like the, the, the very first golden rule that as people or licensed realtors, licensed realtors, licensed real estate professionals who happen to be realtor members, what is one of the very first things that we need to do to take advantage of referrals? Yeah, I would say if I'm going to go with a standard golden rule, don't make it about you. Stop making about it. Stop making it about you. Make it about them. Right. We've all seen those business cards that say like the greatest compliment you could give me is a referral or, you know, thank you for helping me grow. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in the referral game is to make it about you or your business as opposed to them and their network and how they can serve their sphere. So in uh, just by the business card alone, how would I change the language of the business card to make it about them? I wouldn't necessarily put anything about a referral on the business card. Okay. Right? So, so that's something that as they, the whole tr trick to referrals, I, and I'm probably getting into this a little bit too early, but probably there's two really huge misconceptions in the real estate industry or in sales for that matter. One is that referrals are DIY, do it yourself. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. You, you can't just wing your way to like referral only. Number two, uh, there's the misconception that, people need to have been in the, in the industry forever to become referral only. And that once again is far from the truth. You could do it in a year if you wanted. It's, it's wow. all about understanding the psychology of what motivates people to refer and then building that into your systems and processes. So I know that you offer training on this. So because I know that sometimes I jump way ahead, right? I go way down the road <laughs> too fast. It's easy. So it's easy. Bring me back, bring me back. And where would, we start, if, if we were gonna follow step-by-step um, -step processes, what is the very first thing? Cause I went straight to the business card, but what would be? <laughs> yeah. Oops. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay. So first thing is just understanding, like it's, it's the foundation, it's understanding what's going on upstairs, okay. right? It's, it's, it's taking a look at yourself, you know, think about the last time you referred somebody mm -hmm. and what was going on there. Why did you do that? You know, what, what was going on upstairs as to what made you do that referral or, or better yet, you know, the last time you were excited about giving a, a referral. So I give a lot of referrals and the very first thing I think about is um, compatibility. So mm -hmm. I like to refer people with like-minded people or people who I know um, is they're going to do a, a good job. So I refer agents, clients all the time, but I'm always thinking about how busy are they right now? What did they do with the last referral that I sent them? What mm -hmm. is their niche or their niche? And one thing that I've started to do is actually give a disclaimer because people will use people for what you did not refer them for. And then I'll get, well, I use them for so-and-so and they didn't do a good job, but that's not why I sent them to you. So what I've started to do when I send referrals is I tell them what the referral is for. If you decide to go off subject with this referral for something I did not refer them for, I don't want to hear about the job they did for something I never told you they could do well. Okay. So I would say, number one, you're way ahead of the game as far as referrers are concerned. Oh. Okay. And, and something for people out there to understand, the people who refer the most also get the most referrals. Okay. You could call that the law of reci reciprocity. You could call it karma. You could, what I call it is when you are referring other people, you, you're in that you're in your client's seat. You understand what's, what motivates you to refer or what doesn't. 
what excites you or what doesn't, you know, what puts your name on the line or, you know, so you're, you're starting to feel all the emotions that your clients would feel as well. So you're better able and better capable to then use that in your process as well. So for people that are listening that want more referrals, if you're not referring, number one, start referring, especially your client, start to figure out who your clients are that work via referral and start to refer them. You're, you're teaching them exactly how to do it back to you. Okay, so that's, that's going a little bit off tangent there, but I wanted to mention that because you're way ahead of a lot of the people that are, that are doing this right now that haven't even got to the point that they're thinking about adding a disclaimer because they don't refer enough to even do that. Okay, so, but, but I want you to go a little bit deeper than that. You know, you, the first thing I said with, with, you know, think about the last time you referred, why you did it. You said, well, I, I care about compatibility. It goes deeper than that. Hmm. Right. Do you, can, do you consider yourself a connector naturally? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. so good. So, so there are people, many of them that identify as connectors. That's, that's part of their identity. It's what they love to do. It's, it, it gives a sense of purpose. It gives them social capital. Okay. And so we, you may have heard this on the last podcast I did, but there's really only two reasons that people refer psychologically speaking. What are those two reasons? Is social capital. We've all heard of, yeah, so let's talk about that. So you have financial, what, what does it mean if you have financial capital? You've got a lot of it. Yeah. You're wealthy. I mean, I got, yeah, I got money. Uh-huh. You got money, right? If you've got social capital, it means you've got a big sphere and you're important within that sphere. Okay, and that's since the dawn of human history, people were, were tribal beings. You know, it's, a, it's important for us to be in community, to be in tribe, and also to be important within that community and tribe. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by providing some item of value for those others in our tribe that maybe they can't get themselves, right? So the connection that you make for somebody that they might not be able to get on their cell, on, on, you know, by themselves, it all of a sudden raises your status a little bit within your tribe with that person, with that relationship, and that social capital. Oh, and you know what? I consider it goodwill. So now I know <laughs> it's social capital. Subconsciously, the other thing with that real quick, subconsciously, most people don't realize that that's why they're doing it, right? Because it feels good to make that connection. The goodwill aspect of it, right? That, that uh, shot of serotonin that you get from making that connection and making that person happy. We actually, it was so important to be in tribe to survive back in the day that the reward center of our brain actually gives you a shot of, you know, serotonin every time that you make a connection. That's why it feels good to be in love. That's why it feels good to date. That's why it feels good to set up friends. That's why it feels good to put somebody with a business person that can help them. You're getting rewarded for making those connections. So on the outside, it, it, it is goodwill, but underneath it's also social capital. You're also building your importance within your tribe every time you do that. And it feels good. Well, it does because that, that's what I do naturally and I connect people and I provide them with resources, especially as, as, as a speaker, trainer, instructor. Right. And every time I help someone, I feel, I feel good. So now I'm understanding that and people, you know, come to rely on recommendations I make. And sometimes it's not even a recommendation. The other day I posted a piece of avocado toast at a restaurant I had never gone to. It was trending on Yelp. And the very next day, my sorority sister posted, Marky, thanks for the heads up. Uh, had the same thing you had today. And I'm like, yeah, but I, all I did was simply check in, right? I think I might've said it was good. I said on a yeah. date with me, myself and I delicious, right? And People, if I post that, they want to know. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I posted some tomato uh, soup. And I'm like, this is the best uh, tomato basil soup I've ever eaten in my life, right? And people are starting to eat the tomato basil soup. And then they'll tag me in their salad like, oh, and we had the salad too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, okay, okay. So now I get it. Uh, instead of goodwill, now I am a social connector. Is that what you said? Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. And here's the other thing to Understand, like you obviously you've got an immense amount of social capital you've got a big sphere and people trust your opinion and so they come to you for recommendations which then you know at a, at a psychological subconscious level it means you matter okay so there so there is here's something interesting to think about this is going a little bit deep maybe i don't I'm, I'm i wish i had a better idea of the audience but you guys are realtors so you're smart you'll understand this you know back in the day the will to survive was the most important thing right but um in a higher species like us when the will to survive no longer is the, at the forefront of your mind, the will to matter is. 
everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to matter. And one of the best ways to do that is via uh, connections, becoming a connector and increasing your social capital. So the reason I'm going here, by the way, Marky, is because I want everybody listening to understand that your clients want to refer you. It's natural. So all we have to do is help the process along a little bit. It's not that difficult. Okay. So but once I survive, I naturally want to connect and my clients naturally want to give me referrals. So how do I get there? Like, how do I start? How do I put, well, one, I need to give more referrals in order to get more referrals. So I believe in the law of attraction. Um, yeah. How do I how do I make people naturally refer business to me? Uh, well, okay, you said it's not about me; <laughs> it's all about yeah. them. So, that's, well, that's wow, what would be my next step? So, so next step is to take your sales cycle, right? Everybody in in commission based sales, especially in real estate, has what we call a natural sales cycle, and we want to make sure to to pick strategic points within that cycle that we can add in in what I call soft and referral requests, mm -hmm. but also we want to add more value. So let me give you an idea of what a sales cycle might look like. What I call the courtship experience is from the time that a client gets introduced to you till the time they actually sign on the dotted line with you that they're going to use you, you're, you're courting them as a client, right? That's a, that's an, they're not your client yet, but you want to add as much value as possible during that time period so that they want to work with you. Okay. Um, when they actually sign on the dotted line and they, put the offer on the house and you're the one that put the offer down that first 24 to 48 hours, that would be considered uh, the second part of your sales cycle. That's your onboarding experience. What are you doing in that, in that what we call quote onboarding experience to make them feel like they made the right decision to use you as their, as their agent, as opposed to somebody else out there. Okay. And then once you go into contract from the time that you're in contract to the time the deal closes and funds, that would be the third part of your sales cycle. It's the client experience. And then the fourth part, the fourth natural part would be the post client experience. I don't call it a past client because in my opinion, a past client is somebody who used you once and now they work, work with another realtor. <laughs> so they're a past client. I call it the post client experience. So after they purchase the house between that time and the time they use you again or continue to refer you, what, what kind of experience are they having? You know, so, so the, the most important thing about getting referrals and making it consistent is to systematically add more value than any of your competitors. Okay, your competitors are poor. And what I mean by poor, I mean passing over opportunities repeatedly. Say that again, I love that acronym. Poor, keep your competitors poor. You don't wanna be poor. And that's passing over opportunities repeatedly. There are so many hundreds of thousands of dollars left on the table in every individual person's you know, year just by the sheer number of opportunities that they've passed over with regard to the referral game. Okay, so once you get a client in the door, you want to multiply those clients. So the, basically what I teach, the perfect equation for referrals is you should average three qualified referrals for every one client that you get. Now it doesn't mean that every client's going to refer you three, but you should average that. So one to nine, essentially, right? So if every one to three, then the three to nine, and then the, the nine to 27, right? It's kind of like the uh, mathematical philosophy. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so coming back to the different parts of the sales cycle, how mm -hmm. would one add value? So we talked about the onboarding experience. How, as I... I, as an agent, how would I add additional value to that onboarding experience so then I make my competitors poor? Yeah, I've got worksheets for this. Uh, in a nutshell, you got to understand the contributing factors that also contribute to referrals. Okay, so we know that social capital is one of the biggest reasons that people refer. Another one is what we call cognitive dissonance or buyer's remorse. Okay, so um, one of the best ways they can validate the decision to have used you is to refer somebody else to you and ha hear that person say, wow, thanks for that referral. This, you know, Marky's great, right? So you're actually passing over opportunities repeatedly if you're not requesting referrals at the very beginning of a transaction. You're missing that entire first 48, that, that onboarding experience. That is one of the highest probability times in your entire sales cycle to get referrals. And most people wait to the end. They're like, oh, I got to wait till I earn the right to ask for the referral. I got to wait till the deal closes. And there's windows there that you're missing that have very high probabilities of referrals. Um, so, but to go back to your question, 
you got to understand the, the contributing factors. There's seven of them. Trust. There has to be some love if they're going to refer you. Social proof. Okay, they've got to see that other people are using you, right? So, you know, back in the day with the Jordans is the best example I can think of, you know, when, when Mike was around and, um, you know, he started with Nike and, and who knows if Nike had the best shoes back then. I mean, it could have been Adidas or British Knights, you know, I remember I wanted one of the BKs, but since Mike was wearing them, that was the social proof. Everybody started buying them because Mike had them. So they must be the best, right? So the social proof, you want to build that. You want your clients to see that other people are using you too. The third contributing factor is authority. So they need to know that you know what you're doing, that you're not brand new, that you're not fumbling through process. So what can you do to show that you're the authority? Um, you know, so, and we'll keep going through these as we go, go through this, but with these contributing factors, that's how you add value. So what I would say in your courtship period, trust is the first contributing factor, right? What's, what's one simple little thing that you're not doing right now in that, in that part of your cell cycle that you can do to add a little bit more trust. I There's guess a, always be on time. Great. This is a great one. So that's, that's a huge value add. If you're always on time, they're going to trust you. Okay. There's there. I mean, I'm not, we could go through many examples, but there's a billion different ways that you could figure out how to add a, another level of trust in that specific area, right? And so that goes on your little checklist. You're like, okay, during my courtship period, I do this, I do this, I do this. I do. These are my value adds. And each one is aligned with those contributing factors. Okay. The best way I can, the best way I can give an example of this is, you know, for, for realtors to understand is, you know, let's say somebody is, wants to, so they go spend $20,000 on one bedroom as opposed to putting that $20,000 into the kitchen or into the bathroom, right? There's certain things they can put their money into that's going to give them a much higher return than other things. The same is true with value adds in your sales cycle. You can, you, there's a billion things you can do to try and add more value, but if it's not attached to one of those seven contributing factors, then you're not getting your full return, if that makes sense. So the ones that we went over already would be trust, uh, social proof, and authority. Uh, the social proof, I'm, I'm, I tell people all the time, you got to have social proof today. It's, it's when you tell, uh, hmm, what we see, on, well, perception is reality. And what we see online True. basically Absolutely. often dictates. So someone said the other day, we're going to have the biggest real estate summit. And I, and I heard, and I was like, how is she going to have the biggest, right? <laughs> um, because nothing online dictates <laughs> that she could have the biggest, right? And the then uh, a post came out afterwards, and I think it was 20, 25 people there. Well, no, there's no way that was the biggest. So the social proof did not line up with the marketing, which now – breaks down our trust, right? And credibility. Um, 100%. And the reason I knew in the beginning was because she didn't have the authority. Got it. So people don't understand that people are looking at you and they need everything to line up. That, yeah, everything needs to be aligned. If, it's, if, if one thing is out of alignment in, in your marketing and in, in your authenticity, Right. Maybe you market yourself as one thing, but when they come and meet you and are talking with you, it's totally trust goes out the window. OK, I would say that every realtor needs to be authentically themselves. Authentically. Right. You can't be someone else. And there's times we see another person and instantly we want to take on their persona, their marketing, their branding. And it's just not a good fit. And then people also remember where they've seen things before as well. And so you 100 percent correct. You have to be authentically you. So we've, we're working on the trust, uh, the social proof, and the authenticity. What, what, what will we do next? Yeah, so the next, so the next one is, do you want me to just go through what those seven contributing factors are? Um, well, quick? yeah, and then we can tie them into other places. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, let's do that. So the first one is trust. Okay? And, and here's something about trust. Most people think that you need time to gain trust. Trust can be gained immediately. Okay? First of all, if they were referred to you, you're already working off of a level of trust. You've got some borrowed trust there. Okay, you've, you've got a, a connection in, in, in common. The second thing, are you familiar with Simon Sinek? No. He was talking to a group of New Yorkers and he told, he said, hey, everybody here, raise your hand if you're friends with everybody in New York. And obviously nobody is friends with everybody in New York, so nobody raised their hands. And he's like, okay, well, think about this. If you're in Los Angeles and you're in a bagel shop and you hear the couple behind you talking and they happen to be talking in what you think is a New York accent, and you turn around and ask them, hey, where are you guys from? 
And they're like, oh, we're from the Bronx. If you're from the same spot, you have trust immediately just because of that, that common background, that common experience. So if that couple says, hey, you know what? This bagel shop's great, but we ate at this uh, hamburger joint last night. It's the best we've ever had. You've got to try this place, Right. If they tell you that, you're much more likely to go off of that recommendation than just some random person in the bagel shop who's like, hey, you tried this hamburger place. You see, so trust can be earned immediately. So one of the biggest things I do with my clients is like I Facebook that, like I stalk the heck out of them. I go straight CIA on my clients when I have time to do it. Like if their kid plays baseball, if they've got a dog and I got my dog in the back, whatever I can do to, to, to you'll hear it called common ground sometimes, but anytime you can even make mention of it, the level of trust goes up a little bit. You know what? Yeah. And and what I'm thinking about is how, well, one, how you can build it, but then also easy how you could lose it. Right. So one of the things I'm from Chicago and a lot of people profess to be from Chicago. So people will always say where from. And at the moment, they say anything that is outside of Chicago, a suburb instantly (laughs) You, we, we And we joke about it all the time because we have, I see all kind of memes with circles around the city of Chicago. It says, this is Chicago, this is not. <laughs> but they'll be like, oh, I'm from Chicago. Where you from? Aurora. Aurora is not Chicago. So instantly, <laughs> right, we want to talk about them. We Jones and them. We like, man, you don't know nothing about the city of Chicago. So quick, as quick as it can be built. But then if I talk to that person and they like, well, I'm from High Park. Oh, High Park. And then you start that dialogue, right? Uh, and so I could see just whether it's the same city, same high school, maybe same college, uh, things of that nature instantly help to build your children go to the same school. So I talk to parents whose children went to the same college as my son. Instantly, we think different, right? Because, well, one, we know the financial sacrifice that we made to get <laughs> kids through school. So, yeah, I could see, I could see it working both ways, um, you know, especially if what you know about it isn't what they're saying or if that person is a fibber. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and, and that goes for sure. And you'll find those. And, and you know, that's something that, that – you know, my entire approach is a client centric approach and it's one of authenticity and it's, it's, you know, don't try and be something that you're not because trust, you'll lose trust one way or the other, you're going to lose it. Okay. But if you're, if you're yourself, like you can, you know, I talk a lot about picking your ideal clients as well and really niching down, even in real estate that you know, no realtor wants to niche. You know, every, every, everybody that I talk to is like, I can help everybody, which is true. But, but my goodness, if you can niche, um, in your branding and the way you talk and, and who you're looking for and how you teach your clients to refer you. Oh my gosh. Like you're, you're the floodgates will open um, because you're, you're, you're talking with your people, right? You're talking with people that you know, that you understand a language that they understand. Um, so I'm, I'm, tan- I'm going to, you'll find I go off on tangents occasionally. So just bring okay. me back if I go off on a tangent. I'm but trust. So, so <laughs> number trust. one, trust. Right. Number two. So, and, and the way, the way that I say this, by the way, real quick, when you ask, how can I get better? Just look at each of those four stages of your sales cycle in your courtship period. What's one simple little thing that you can do extra that you're not doing right now that can help you add more trust, right? Just, you know, think of one thing that you can do anything. Well, I'm, I'm, it would, it, well, in the courtship, it is other than the trust. It is the trust. One thing, uh, when my husband was courting me, I didn't like it at first that he was so direct, but then mm-hmm. it built so much credibility. Um, and, and he wasn't trying to oversell himself. Like he showed me his character defects and he told me straight up what they were. And so I had a choice right then and there if I wanted to do business, you know, essentially do business with him based on his terms. But then I couldn't come back and complain about it because he had already told me about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. You, it's funny you mentioned that. You hear all the time, like in sales, that you need to like be a chameleon, right? You need to to be like your client. But as far as the referrals are, you know, that's great for closing deals. But as far as you, the back end of that, the perpetual growth, um, I think that there's a line there. I think you, you do. You need to be yourself. You need to be upfront. You need to be very uh, like like how your husband was with you. Like he could have chameleoned, and he would have found later on that there's other stuff going on there that would have you, you wouldn't have trusted it, right? But he he didn't. Um, so yeah, so trust, so that's the best way to build in every area. So like I have worksheets for this. We go through the sales cycle, you know, on on the workshops that I do that are like three hours or less. We actually go through and 
we hit each area of your cell cycle and, and we basically just work through this workbook, which is makes it super simple and, and uh, light and easy for you to really, you know, build your, build your process out, really build a perfect process for you. Um, so trust is one social proof is the other. That's the second one. Okay. So how do you build social proof? Are you asking for reviews on all the sites? Are you, um, you know, are you, are you putting information out? Are you putting content out? Are you taking pictures at your listings? Are you, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can build social proof, but um, you know, I have a scale from one to five. One is like, I got no reviews and I haven't ever asked. Five is like, I've got more reviews than any other, any other competitor in my area, right? Like I've got the most. Social proof is huge, especially if you work with millennials in any way. They're going to look you up before they use you. <laughs> They're looking for reviews. Ain't that the truth. One thing that I started to do on the social proof, because I do all of these events, I capture a ton of photos and videos. I drop them all into a Dropbox folder and then I share them back with the organization to one for follow up purposes to show the exciting time that we had. And I don't, so I would add that as a value add. I don't leave it for them to do it. It's something that I instantly send out and now I can tag people in the photos and things of that nature. So I'm essentially my own photographer at these events because it doesn't cost me extra money to pull out my phone and take a photo. It's super smart. I mean, there's, like, like we say, there's so many different ways that you can show proof, uh, proof that people use you, you know, that you can expound or expand on your social proof. It's way to do it. You know, I think it's phenomenal. So anything that you can do within your, you know, sales cycle to add more social proof, it's, that's huge. And also realize that if you, once again, if you got referred, there's social proof there as well. The person that referred them already used you, you know, so you, one and two is already there. You got the trust and you got uh, some social proof just from the referral alone. That's why referrals are so huge. That's why they're so much easier than cold traffic. And there's so much less you have to do because you're working on a lot of this borrowed trust and borrowed social proof that, that you know, makes it so much easier. That's why you want to be referral only. Um, so number three is authority. You want to come off as the authority, even if you're brand new, you know, you want people to that you know what you're doing. And, you know, so one of the best ways that I can think to do that is through content, right? Do a podcast, uh, guest, reach out to podcasters and, and try and guest on their podcast and then take that and put it on your website or put it on your social, um, you know, write a pamphlet. I mean, when you, when you sit down and have your first meeting with a prospective client, if you, even if you can push like a little one sheeter in front of them or a couple little pages that you wrote about, this is the, this is the process. This is my process. These are the value adds that anything that you can author. And, and when I say author, I'm, it could be a page and put in front of them. It automatically raises your level of authority, right? You got so many other agents out there that are just winging it. They, just, they, they don't do that stuff. They don't think it's important. They don't maybe understand that it's important. But if you sit down with uh, Joe Schmo and you sit down with me, I guarantee that I'm going to be directing you to some content that I've written uh, or done, whether that be audio written or video. Okay. What's number four? Number four is scarcity. So, mm. uh, you know, you want that, that kind of goes a little bit with, it's a little bit intertwined with social proof. You want people to think that, that you're busy, right? If, if, if I'm, if I go to the dentist and they're like, oh, I've got, just pick any time you want. Just the, my entire calendar is open up to you. I'll, I'll go with whatever you want. Um, I'm going to be like, I want another dentist. <laughs> like, obviously nobody's coming to you. Um, but also I don't want it to be so busy that I got to wait four weeks to get an appointment. Okay. So, so you got to kind of do the scarcity dance. You want them to know that you're busy, that you're in demand but also that you're going to make availability for them or more importantly, you're going to make availability for the people that they refer to you. So I would say as a real estate agent, if you're not using some form, some sort of calendar app, you know, whether that be Calendly or square or some other type of calendar app, I would send that to my clients for any, for, you know, obviously you've got to be, it's a little bit different with real estate because you want to be available as much as possible, but you know, pick like some hours, you know, pick like between like, I don't know, two and six, you know, you can put that you're, you're available between two and six and you can put that you're available between like eight and 12, you know, but what just be, being able to text them your calendar and have them pick a slot in your calendar, that one little thing right there is, is helping you use scarcity to your advantage. 
Yeah, they see that you're on your game. That's also adding value to that uh, to the process as well. So I, I like the scarcity yeah. with utilizing the calendar app. Well, and they're more likely to actually show up for the appointment and do it on time. How many times have you set an appointment with a client and they're like a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour late. And you're like, you're doing your day around those appointments. You know, so just the simple act of them clicking on a time slot in a calendar app is going to make them much, you know, much more likely, like seven times more likely to actually be there and be there on time. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Okay. Seven times more likely. It's Number called the commitment theory, by the way. Oh, it's a theory? <laughs> when you, it is. When you commit to doing something, you're seven times more likely to do that. So when you actually choose a slot on somebody's calendar and you click it, you've just committed yourself to being there at that. Like you've clicked it, you know, so, so you're much more likely to actually show up and be on time and take that meeting more seriously. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So now I got to find the commitment theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's outside though. Okay. So number, what are we? Number five? Number five. Number five right? Okay. Engagement. This one is, this one is more important than any other for referrals. How do you give your clients some level of buy-in in your business? Like they feel they've got to say, like they feel like they're a part of it. Okay. Um, satisfied clients and content clients don't refer engaged clients refer. So and, and so what I mean by that is how many times have you ever had a client say, Oh, I'm going to tell everybody. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So would that, uh, when you say like have a say and be engaged, are we talking to like surveys, uh, opinions, yeah. things like surveys, that? Surveys, opinions, all, yeah, exactly. Anything you can do to, to get them engaged in the process, make it more than just a transaction. Okay. Satisfied okay. and content clients, that's transactional. Here's, a, here's an interesting thing for, for the viewers um, or listeners. There was a, the biggest study ever on referrals was done in 2015. It's called the anatomy of the referral. They did it in the financial services industry, like uh, wealth advisors. And what they found was they had four different client types. They had disgruntled, content, satisfied, and engaged. And they did three different companies, big companies over the course of a year. Yeah. So the disgruntled clients, the ones that were pissed, they were mad, like something went horribly wrong they found that they actually provided more referrals than the clients that identified as content or satisfied that maybe gave a five-star review. It seems counterintuitive, but tell me this, have you, have you ever had an experience that was really horrible with a company and then you complained and then the company was like, whatever we can do to make this right, we're going to make it right. So maybe you got some free stuff. Maybe like you got extra attention. Right now, all of a sudden they're engaging you. You're like, okay, they're, they're trying to make it right. They're doing, like, they care. You see what I'm saying? Just yeah. the act of being disgruntled and complaining, make almost strong arms that company into engaging you. And then once they actually make it right, if they make it right, you now, now you love them. You hate it. You went from hate to love. Wow. Okay. And, and, and there's a couple of companies that, that have done that. There's only one company that I wouldn't still to this day not refer to because mm -hmm. the experience was just, I took their free giveaways, but I was just so mad that I, <laughs> like we're done. Yeah, it was just, I was like, yeah, I was done. So nothing, nothing they could have done. And I knew that at that time, uh, could have savaged, uh, salvaged our, I'm sorry, salvaged our relationship. Uh, but then there are some places definitely that I've referred to, uh, because they made it right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here, so here's the important part. Let's talk about the engaged category now, because we just talked about disgruntled, content, and satisfied. The engaged clients that identified is like, they felt like they had some buy-in in it. Every single one gave referrals. Okay, so this is where in the referral consulting that I do, I teach the 80-20 principle. Most, most salespeople in general, realtors alike, and, and it lenders, anybody that's in sales, they focus 80% of their attention on the satisfied content or even disgruntled clients trying to get those people to refer. And they kind of forget about their raving fans, the 20% that are already there. And they're like, Hey, I've already got them. I need to get this group too now. But what they're, what they're missing is that if they took that 80% of time and put it on that like 10 or 20% group, the raving fans, that will triple or quadruple their business. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so it's, it, that's because, because those ones, 
like those are your referral centers. Those are the, those are the people that you build your entire career around. You know, if they, if, if somebody has referred you once, they can refer you a thousand times and they will, if you, you foster it. Okay. So, now- so, you know, what I teach is engage as many of your clients as possible through your process and then focus all of your efforts on that group, build that group. The content and satisfied clients will always be content and satisfied because you get a great process. There's a lot of value there. The disgruntled ones, there's people that are always going to be disgruntled. But focus all of your efforts on your raving fans. Hmm. What's number six? Because engagement was number out of everything was where we should yep. focus, right? So, yep, exactly. Engagement's the biggest one as far as referrals are concerned. Engagement will build trust. And, and like, and there, there's so many other things there. So engagement is the number one. Engage okay. your clients in every way possible. Uh, number six is commitment. This is the commitment theory. So let me give you an example of how this would look. It's really simple. We don't need to spend much time on it. Have you ever had a client say, this has been the best experience ever. I'm going to tell everybody about you. Yes. And then, and then have you ever had that happen and not get anything? Yes. So the commitment theory is if somebody says, you know, hey, I'm going to tell everybody about you. Um, and I got a couple of you are going to be, you know, looking here soon. I'm going to tell them about you too. If you said, Hey, you know what? I appreciate that so much. I'm so grateful that you see my value. Would you be open to providing me an email introduction to those people by this next Friday? Now, rather than just saying, Hey, great. Thanks. I appreciate that. Now you just said, Hey, great. Thanks. I appreciate that. Would you be open to connecting us by Friday? As soon as they say yes, sure. They're seven times more likely to actually get, because a referral means nothing unless there's an introduction at the end of it. I don't care if you get a billion referrals. If there's not an introduction that comes as a result of that referral, that it means nothing. Word of mouth is great and, you know, great um, when people use you. But there's a lot of people out there that have phenomenal word of mouth, but they're not necessarily getting the referrals that deals from the referrals, as we would say. So the introduction is what we need to focus on more so than the referral. The intro. Yeah. And, and that's the com- it. commit them. Yeah. And so that way, if, if that email doesn't come on Friday and you follow up on Monday and you're like, Hey John, um, just wanted to check in. I know that we talked about introducing me to so-and-so by this last Friday. Is that still something we can do? John's not going to be like, Oh, get off my back. Uh, I told you, I, right. He committed to doing it on Friday. He's gonna be like, Oh my gosh, it totally slipped my mind. Yes. Let me do that today. It's a completely different feeling when you started with the commitment as opposed to like trying to follow up where there was never anything committed. You know, if you follow up and you never committed them, they're going to be like, dude, stop bugging me. I'll do it when I have time, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Uh, So it seemed like to me, the commitment is really coming right after the engagement. Like, cause that's where the intro comes in. Right. The second that they say that they're willing to introduce you to somebody or they have somebody in mind, or they're going to tell everybody about you, take that and make a commitment out of it. Make a commitment out of it. Okay. Like, hey, that's phenomenal. Would you be able to introduce me to maybe one person by the next Friday? Yeah, exactly. Ah, and what's that final step? Ether. Excitement. What did you call it? Did you say ether? Ether. Ah. Yeah, the, the ether. The ether. So the ether of the sale. You hear that a lot in the car industry. That's why they don't want to let you off the lot. When you're driving that new that new car and you get back to the lot and they're like, don't let them leave before the ether runs out. <laughs> Cause when you leave the lot, all of a sudden like logic sets in and you're like, Oh man, yeah, I, I should, I should, <laughs> right. They're going to get you right on the spot when you're excited. Um, every, every sales cycle has natural ether spike points, points in that cycle where the client is excited. Something happened. I see you laughing. <laughs> this is why I have not purchased a car in nine years because of the <laughs> amount of time that you have to spend on the car lot. Like it is the most agonizing experience ever known yes, to mankind. Yes. And my best car experience was I picked the car off of eBay. I had mm-hmm. my financing already lined up at the bank. I walked in there with what they had to give me the car for, or I was getting on a flight to go to Kansas city to pick the car up. And we made that, that was the best buying experience ever. But if you don't have all those ducks in a row, (laughs) you're in for a, you're in for a day. Oh, and I have brought cars home, test drove them and take them back. Right. Cause then it's still another four hours. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? <laughs> on the tail end of it. Oh, yeah. my God. Okay, glad this I is know. hilarious. The yes, ether. I completely understand. <laughs> yeah, the ether. Yeah, the ether. <laughs> so, so, let me, so let me give you an example. Uh, when you write an offer and that offer gets accepted, that's an ether spike point, right? When an appraisal comes in at value or above value, maybe, ether spike point, okay? When you do the final walkthrough, they've got their, they've got their final approval from the lender and you're doing that walkthrough, okay? They, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's some points. You hand them the keys after the loan fund. I mean, there's like six or seven really amazing spike points. Real estate, like realtors are so lucky. Yeah, like I don't think realtors understand if you're a wealth advisor, you don't have very many spike points, right? Like, like people aren't all, you didn't just make like a billion dollars overnight. Like you're actually, you're like, you're watching it every day and it's just, right? But in real estate, man, like you can really take referrals and make it work for you because you have such uh, emotional uh, spike points in that in that small 30 day period or whatever you're you know here in San Diego it's like 14 days and some other places like 45 depending on how appraisals are going but um man you got a lot to build around and now, so I would say go ahead I had to change my language because I said it was an emotional roller coaster ride but now what I'm realizing is that it's the ether <laughs> it's the ether yeah and, and you know and and if you go at it from that angle if you go at it from like, guys, listen, there are going to be some immensely like emotional and exciting points. And we're going to make sure that like we take care of you on all it. But if you go at it from like, there's some, from that angle, it's going to be, it's going to come off so much more positive And like, you, even if they don't naturally get excited, you're going to be getting them excited because you're building your process around those spike points. Okay. So all these value adds that we're doing in our transaction where we're including trust and social proof and authority, we're trying to hit on as many of those also spike points because okay. that's where, when there's ether, there's, there's going to be it, engagement is easy. Okay. The, ah. There's trust is easy there. Listen, if, if somebody just um, got their offer accepted and, and they're like, man, I, you know, they want to introduce you to people. Like there's so much likely when you're doing things that are getting them excited and, and, and positively emotional, they, they want to reciprocate, you know, and the only way that they can really do that is, is via referrals and uh, just a bunch of thank yous, right? Like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's turn those thank yous into referrals and turn those referrals into introductions. Wow. Whoo. Okay. So we got the sales cycle with the four steps and then we have our seven steps, but I know that you told me, cause let me tell you this. This is uh, referrals on steroids. And um, <laughs> yeah, what I was doing was clearly generic uh, in the referral game. So I need to step it up in the referral game. Uh, you've shared a plethora of information, Chad, but how would one connect with you? How would one put a system in place or utilize your system that you've developed in order to increase their referrals? Because I mean, I'm looking at these referral checks. I'm getting their pretty nice checks, right? Um, yeah. And so it can pay. For, it pays for it. It is. It can be its own business. Referral based business can be its own business. Um, how would one connect with you? Uh, get your resources and tools. What do they need to do next? Yeah. So uh, they need to pay attention to you because I do workshops every single month. Okay. And on these workshops, in less, I know it seems like I've shared a lot of information here because I've got a small amount of time. But on these workshops, when you come into one of these workshops, we take you from step one to the end and it's, it's easy. And we help you build your process during, by the, by the time you walk away from that workshop, your processes are already going to be ready to go. You're going to walk away to like double your business already. Yeah, you'll, you'll go get referrals that week. So um, your audience will probably be hearing whatever month your audience is hearing this in, uh, maybe they, they, they can go to the modernreferral.com, which actually, you know what, that's probably not the best place to send them right now because I don't have, I don't have the date set. You know, I set it every month um, because they're live interactive workshops. So th this isn't like a pre-recorded thing where people come in and it's not like a webinar that, you know, you're going to come in and people are going to try and cross sell you and upsell you. And like, it's a, it's a one time you come in three hours or less, less than 300 bucks and you're walking away with your process built. Um, 
So then we, I'm going to have yeah, to so send I'll, that I'll link you, out to my you, So I'll give you the dates for whatever month this podcast is going to air. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'll send you the, the date. I'll send you the link. You can send it to anybody in your sphere or that listens here, any of your viewers, that they can come join that with us. Um, on top of that, they're going to get my free four-month video course. So okay. we're going to take in three hours, get them all set up. They're, they're ready to go when they walk away. Um, they're going to get included to the Facebook community, which is a private community full of like-minded leaders who are sharing what's working. They're implementing, they're experimenting, they're adjusting. There's so many ideas and, and just really amazing stuff. Like it's just people that love to share with each other that are very involved in referrals. So if you want to be a master of referrals, you have to do this. If you take a client centric approach, if you love on your clients, if you want to add more value than your competitors, this is a must. Um, you know, so they get that free video course afterwards as well. Um, there, there's, I mean, there's like 10 free things they're going to get. It, it, it'll blow your viewers' minds. So, oh, well, I'm uh, glad to hear that because I want their minds to be blown. I think their minds are already blown right. um, because they haven't been treating their referrals good and adding value. Uh, and so just the, the, the four different um, – the four different parts with the seven different steps. And then you've talked about the fact that you have worksheets and things of that nature, which they can develop oh, their yeah. own formal system, but mm-hmm. they leave so much money on the table. And I think the one thing that stood out for me is uh, the engagement aspect and the social proof, which I'm always talking about engagement and social proof, but I think yeah. that I need to be a little bit more focused. Uh, and so good, good, good stuff, Chad. I truly appreciate you. You're going to share that link. We're going to make sure that we refer people over because real estate is all about building referrals. Uh, and those agents that don't build referrals, it, it I noticed uh, when I see people who buy leads, they put themselves in a lifelong cycle of buying leads, which means they earn yeah. less money because of the amount of money that they're paying for those leads. You have no control when you're buying leads. The, the person giving the leads has control. With referrals, you build your business and it's, it's, it's a perpetual growth machine. Like it's, it's, and it's your machine. I right? love it. So, okay, Chad, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So thank Go you ahead. for sharing. Uh, I'm glad that people watching will be able to build a perpetual growth machine and that they can reach out to you to attend one of your three hour workshops where they can build their own referral system. Uh, I will tell you they need a referral system because it's nothing like getting a check and some t- and, and, and getting a check and sometimes you forget the person's name. I hate to admit that, but I can say this to the <laughs> real, estate, <laughs> real estate community. So one more time, tell people how they can connect with you online. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's going to be the modernreferral.com. Okay. They can check that out. That's the landing page for the workshops. That's really where you're going to go and, and you get a bunch more information on what you're going to get. I update that page every month. So whatever month they're listening to, they can go to that page and they're going to see when the next workshop is. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate you for listening today and finding out how you're going to step your game up and earn more money with referral-based business. See you soon.